One more time. Good evening. Thank you. There is life in Campbell. Hallelujah. I want to welcome you once again to the Alpha and Omega seminar, The Story of Hope. And how many of you had a great Sabbath day today? Amen. I did too. It was so such a blessed day, such a beautiful day. Before we begin our seminar tonight, I would invite you again to please bow your heads as we ask God's blessing on our meeting tonight. Lord in heaven, God of the universe, we stand in awe of your mercy and your grace. And we thank you, Lord, that you have showered us even today with with waves of grace and waves of mercy. And we rejoice tonight, Father, that we can be here to once again hear you speak to us through your word. And so tonight, Father, we, we ask a special blessing on our speaker, Stephen Hicks, as he breaks open for us the bread of life. Use him in a powerful way tonight to speak to our hearts and our minds, and may the Holy Spirit bring conviction where conviction is needed. May the Holy Spirit bring comfort where comfort is needed. And we will be quick to give you all the praise, for indeed it belongs to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so tonight, without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker tonight, Stephen Hicks, who is going to introduce the next part of our program. Pastor. Hi, good evening. I'm not starting the message yet. I just wanted to give a quick announcement or reminder. On the first and second night that we were here, I announced a Bible giveaway. And the criteria for this was to come to nine out of ten of the first meetings. That's why I haven't mentioned it since the beginning. But since today is our ninth meeting, that means tomorrow is the tenth meeting. So after registration tomorrow, I will be asking the registration team to compile a list of who gets a free Bible. I'm just reminding you. So if you have been coming but not been checking in, go see those folks tonight and correct that record because we want you to have the Bible that you have earned by your attendance. And so I'm going to take a quick break while I ask uh, Lorena to come up here and give us a wonderful song. She's actually going to play and sing because she is multi-talented. So I'll see you in just a few minutes. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Lorena, for that wonderful song. And thank you for being considerate of us before you pull that thing out of the guitar. <laughs> okay, well, welcome again, and I hope you're having a good evening. We are going to continue, actually, even though this is its own message tonight. In my mind, it's kind of part three of what we've been looking at, last night being part one, this morning being part two. They're three different messages, but in my mind, they're all very much similar, very much uh, connected. And so we're going to wrap this up, this little exploration of Sabbath last night. We looked at the Ten Commandments or the Law of God this morning, and tonight, this really was working a few minutes ago. But it's not right now. All right, well, tonight's message is called Knowing the Character of God. And so we are going to round out this, um, this kind of story of the Sabbath and the law by, by that final piece that makes it all make sense. Now, we saw this morning that God's law is incredibly important to him. We saw, in fact, that the law of God was so important to him that it was enough to sacrifice Jesus over as the only possible way to save humanity from ourselves. And so with all of the talk this morning and kind of in general and this emphasis on the law of God, it is very easy to get the impression that God requires us to perfectly keep such law, okay, perfectly without fail, that somehow we will earn back the favor with God that we lost by keeping the law. That's, that's, that's the easy way to think about this. Now, if God were a human being, that is exactly how this would work. But God is not a human being. See, we emphasize the law. Therefore, we want the law to be kept, right? We require it to be kept, and we almost use the law to judge one another and condemn one another because I keep the law better than you. <laughs> But God is not like that. God is not like us. In fact, we read in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, thank you, brothers, um, where God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so since God does not think the same way that we do, then we must learn to think like him if we want to know him. So sure enough, the Bible does specifically tell us that keeping the law does not bring salvation. This is in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, among other places. But this verse says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Tell me, how many, how, how much flesh will be justified by keeping the law? None. It is not the way this works. So tonight, I want to talk about this concept of salvation. I want to talk about what it means, what it does not mean, where it comes from, and how we get it. 
By learning those things, I hope that you will see that we're going to gain insight into the character of God, which is why tonight's message is called Knowing the Character of God. Now, why is it important to know the character of God? We haven't looked at this in a week, but we did look at it twice in the first couple days. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. This is a really sobering passage of the Bible, and it's from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So Jesus is telling us here, that knowing who God actually is, knowing who Jesus actually is, rather than knowing who we want him to be, is the key to heaven. That's the key. That is what we need in order for Jesus not to turn us away. We have to go to the actual Jesus, not the one that we have created. And by the way, this is also the same exact key to preparing for and surviving the end times. So let us turn back to the ancient Israelites, as we have for the last day or so, to learn from their experiences. When we left them this morning, they had just received the Ten Commandments, um, as most of them were at the base of Mount Sinai, and then Moses and the elders went up to meet with God. The next leg of their journey, after the Mount Sinai experience, is going to inform the next chapter of the story of hope for us. Now, after about one year at the base of the mountain, they were there a long time, after about one year, during which time they built up the sanctuary like we've been talking about, they put it into action and and began its services, after all that, they moved. Specifically, God moved. So we read in Exodus chapter 40, that's the final chapter of the book of Exodus, in verse 36, Uh, Actually, 36 through 38, the Bible says, Whenever the cloud, now this was the presence of God, he was uh, resting above the sanctuary in a pillar of cloud so that his presence would not destroy everybody. So it says, Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all of their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. That's pretty cool, right? (laughs) Now just kind of imagine in your mind's eye, imagine millions of people camped together at the base of this mountain in tents. And they did so in perfect geometrical order. Now we're not going to go into that tonight because of time, But God organized their camp in a very specific way with very meticulous detail. That would have been an awesome sight to behold. Now, right in the middle of their camp was the sanctuary, and above the sanctuary was the visible presence of the Almighty God in a pillar of cloud by day, and then when the sun went down, it changed to a pillar of fire to give light by night. I mean, how awesome is that? And you have to wonder... Why such a spectacle was not enough to keep the Israelites from rebelling? (laughs) Now, I know that we're all human and we all make mistakes, but I just, I can't get over that idea, right? If all I had to do was look out the front of my tent and see God right there, it may cause me to think twice about doing something wrong. (laughs) So anyway, God moved after this year of of sitting at the the base of the mountain. And the camp of the Israelites followed after God began to move. And this tells us that God is a leader. He desires to lead. Does that make sense? In fact, when we relate to God correctly, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 38 that the Lord is the one who goes before you and will be with you, and he will not leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, do not fear nor be dismayed. So he will not only go before us and lead us if we allow him to, but he's actually going to keep us company along the way. 
And although the, the Bible does not say it specifically, in my mind's eye, I also see him kind of following along behind us to clean up the mess that we make. God is a good God. The real problem here is not that God does not lead us correctly, but that we often do not want to follow God. So we want to blaze our own trails, especially Americans, right? Have gun, will travel. I will do what I want. The independent American spirit. But God says, no, 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 don't blaze your own trails. Do not lead yourselves because by doing so, we stray from God's path and we get in trouble. So praise the Lord, we are not alone in this impulse. That is the natural human impulse of the heart. It's always been true. So I'm not praising the Lord that we're just as rebellious as everybody else, but, you know, praise the Lord that God works with all of us and we are no more kind of sinful or rebellious than any other group of people have been throughout time. It was not long in the, into their covenant relationship with God that the Israelites failed, and they failed hard, and they failed a lot. We're going to read in Numbers 13, we're going to read a specific instance of them failing. This is just one example. We can read many of, in many instances of their rebellion. But Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 and 2 begins this story. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So what had happened here was God brought them near to the border of the promised land, and he said, yeah, go in and check it out. Well, here's the report that they bring back once they are done scouting. In verse 27, the Bible says, the Bible records the scouts saying, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. <laughs> what is its fruit? Well, it was a luscious land for sure. And I just want you to read verse 23 here. They cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they carried it between two of them on a pole. This blows my mind. Just kind of picture it in your mind's eye. We need two men to carry this one cluster of grapes, okay? And so I'm in the back, and here's my friend up in the front. We've got this pole that we're just resting on our shoulders, and we are going slowly because it is heavy, and we are not carrying a carcass. We are not carrying uh, building materials. What we're carrying is a cluster of grapes so big that I cannot carry it by myself. That is an amazing cluster of grapes. <laughs> and the Bible just, the, the Bible says they were impressed with it, for sure. Now, obviously, the Middle East today does not produce grapes the size of men. Right? So the environment and the climate were very, very different back then. And we have to remember, if we kind of remember back to Sunday, the beginning of this world, right, we saw that the Great Flood had tremendous environmental impact on our world. And so this would be approximately a thousand years after the Flood. So it would have been at the tail end of this ice age, right? That superheated ocean from the flood, superheated because of the volcanic activity when the continents tore themselves apart, that would have created extreme cloud cover, just like a hot shower on a cold day does to your mirror. And that would have cooled off the whole planet everywhere except the ocean because that had its own heat source. And so most of the land at this point in history would have been covered in ice or at least colder than people would like. We saw in the table of nations of Genesis 10, as the people kind of spread out, they stuck mostly to the coasts. Surprise, it's like the inland was not habitable in a proper way. So anyway, the coastal areas, despite this extreme cold, the coastal areas would have been lush and fertile. And the valley of Canaan was apparently especially fertile. So we read in verse 28. We're still in Numbers 13. This is a continuation of the report that comes back. They say, Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Now, who are the descendants of Anak, and why are they of a particular concern to the Israelites? 
Verse 33, there we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Do you remember the giants? Yeah, we looked at them on Sunday too. The inhabitants of the earth prior to the flood are recorded in Genesis 6 as giants. And actually, some of our modern translations don't use the word giants. They use the word Nephilim, that mysterious word, which causes all sorts of weird theology. But I think that this verse here can kind of squash all that theology because there we saw the giants. It's that same word, Nephilim, and it refers to human beings here. Anyway, that was in Genesis 6-4, if you want to look it up. That's the first time we see giants or Nephilim. So this race of people, the descendants of Anak, apparently retained some genetic vitality that many, most others had lost by this time. So they were greater in physical stature than most of the other people alive at that time. They lived in a land with grapes the size of men. Amen? This was not a normal land. Now spiritually, if we kind of spiritualize this, Canaan represents the Garden of Eden. It was a land prepared and promised by God. It was a fertile land that supports giant and abundant life. So it is obviously not the exact Garden of Eden, but is a spiritual representation of them, of it. And so God gave Israel a way back to the Garden of Eden, spiritually speaking. And Israel said no. Can you imagine that? They said no. Numbers 14, verses 2 and 3. All the children of Israel complained against Moses and his brother Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? What are they thinking? Seriously. They had been crying out to God for hundreds of years to get out of Egypt, and the first time it even looks like it's going to get difficult, notice they haven't even done anything difficult yet. It just had the threat of difficulty, and immediately they want to go back to where they wanted to get out of for 200 years. This is a mentality that I do not understand, but nonetheless, that is what they did. And it really, to me, it is amazing how many of us choose on purpose the difficulties of the world instead of the blessings of God. And this is a really good example of that, right? So even with godly encouragement to do the right thing, Israel made the wrong choice. Now, this encouragement came from two of the 12 spies named Joshua and Caleb. They told a different story. They told a positive story amid the ten reports of negativity. Verses 8 and 9, they say, If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Yeah, that didn't work. They forgot. They, not the two good spies, but everybody else seems to have forgotten that when God leads his people to a time of trouble, God will lead them through it successfully, just like at the Red Sea, which they all lived through. Now remember that for your own relationships with God. If God brings you to it, God will bring you through it. Amen? All right. I do not want anybody to quit on God just because it gets a little bit tough. Always have confidence in the Lord, even when the trouble that you are facing seems insurmountable. There is nothing that is insurmountable to God. Amen? Okay. Now, you may feel like a grasshopper against giants, but God is bigger than all. One plus God is a majority. Amen? All right. See, the problem that many of us face today is the same problem that ancient Israel faced at this point. Even with the promise of God's blessing, they still did not trust the Lord, and they wanted their own way instead. 
So after this encouraging report from Joshua and Caleb, the people's response was, yes, let's go do it. We trust in God. No, no, that's not what happened. Numbers 14, verse 10. And all of the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. I mean, it's bad enough that they are now going to take the only two people in the whole congregation who actually trust God and kill them by throwing stones at them until they die. But the verse actually tells us that they are threatening to do so in the very sight of God. He was right there. And somehow they wanted to kill his messengers anyway. Mm. It is easier to kill the messenger than to do it God's way sometimes. And even with God right there in front of their eyes, they just wanted to follow their own hearts instead. So, unfortunately, the Old Testament and even the New Testament, the whole Bible tells us that this was essentially the Israelite and eventually the Jewish way. They just kind of did this over and over. There was constant rebellion, constant violence rather than obedience to God, all the way up to Jesus. I mean, they... They wanted to kill the Messiah instead of accepting him as Messiah, right? And then even beyond Jesus, right up to that very moment that God closed the door of probation on the Jewish nation as the steward of the gospel for the world. They, they just, they never cooperated. The very first Christian martyr was named Stephen. <laughs> and he had just delivered a powerful sermon to the Jewish leaders about Israel's history and the promises of the Messiah all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So instead of listening to their own history and accepting this rebuke from God, the Bible says in Acts 7, verses 57 and 58, they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at Stephen with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him to death, if we keep reading. He dies. So can can you see this? This is literally telling us that they are listening to Stephen, and they go, la, 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 I can't hear you. I mean, that's what they do, rather than, ooh, I just knocked this thing out of my ear. <laughs> they don't want to listen to the truth, and so they don't. And it will forever be this same way with those who reject God. At the very end of time, persecution will come from those professing to worship God. And this is really important to understand. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, it tells us of this ultimate evil that is elsewhere called Babylon. It says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So this just tells us it's a religious power at the end of time. It commands worship from the people. And yet, in the very previous verse, it says it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So God's true people are going to be the victims here, or the intended victims anyway, amen? (laughs) So even professing Christians, those who claim the love and mercy of Jesus Christ, will turn their backs on their brethren at the very end if they have chosen to follow a Jesus of their own creation instead of the Jesus of the Bible. So this is why Jesus emphasizes so strongly knowing who he really is. This is a really, in, really important thing to do, right? Calling somebody else Jesus does not actually make him Jesus, does it? No, and then ultimately it creates a spirit of murder inside the false believer. Why? Because when he is then rebuked with the truth, Just like the Jews in Acts chapter 7, when they are confronted with the truth of God, they just want to kill the messenger instead of actually listening. That that murderous spirit desires to kill instead of confronting its own misconceptions. You need to remember that, please, at least for the next three weeks, because I am probably going to make you mad at least one time before we are done. That is the nature of the Bible. The Bible challenges everybody's beliefs, including my own. I was severely challenged putting this seminar together, as I always am every time I open the Bible. So probably you're going to have, you're going to hear something before we're done that challenges you and upsets you. 
and I would like it very much if you did not take a stone out of your pocket and throw it at me. Is that okay? Can you promise me that? All right, no stones at the preacher. <laughs> so, all right, so let's be like Moses instead, right? Let's be willing to accept the guidance from God and not like Israel desiring to return to Egypt. Amen? Israel rejected the promised land and they rebelled against God. See, God did not break his promises to Israel. But he did execute judgment against the generation of rebels. So how does this story end? Numbers 14, verse 23. God is saying of the rebellious generation, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. Of the entire generation, God permitted exactly two people out of millions to enter into the promised land, and that was, surprise, surprise, Joshua and Caleb, the two positive spies. The rest of them, as it says in verses 33 and 34, became shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years to bear the brunt of their infidelity, right? God says, until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. Friends, we do not want to know God's rejection. Amen? All right. And so we see here an insight into the mind of God. The people spied the land 40 days, so God visited punishment on them for 40 years. The spying was prophetic of God's rejection of the generation, right? We see this day for a year principle here. Now, when we study the certain, certain time prophecies beginning next week, in fact, next Saturday, I think, we're going to see this day for a year prophecy uh, rule in action, okay? One prophetic day equals one literal year. So 40 prophetic days equals 40 literal years. We're going to see this again next week. And so this is it. This tells us God is incredibly demanding. He is exact. He expects obedience and fidelity, and he is willing to deny the reward of the promised land to those who practice disobedience and rebellion. Thankfully, that is not the only side of God. Obedience is so important to God that he withdraws his offer to go before them and protect them due to their disobedience. <sighs> Man, I really wish the story ended here. <laughs> But see, rather than face their punishment of 40 years in the wilderness, these same rebels who rejected the promised land under God's promise of protection now want to take the promised land with their own military strength without God. That is the very definition of righteousness by works. They quite literally tried to work their way into the promised land. And of course, it didn't work, as working for God's favor never does. Verses 44 and 45, we read, They presumed to go up to the mountaintop. Nevertheless, neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormah. And what an object lesson for us about the necessity of dependence on the Lord. When we advance Following God's lead, he brings us success. When we advance without God, disaster comes. <laughs> it puts a very concrete perspective on Christ's statement in John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. But Israel was about to learn of another side of the character of God, and that is the side that we must all be thankful for. See, because despite rejecting the providence of God, despite moving him to anger in this manner, despite shunning his protection to such an extent that they actually lose it, nevertheless, God's first reaction towards them before even pronouncing judgment is this. In verse 20, he says, I have pardoned. Don't miss how profound that is. I have pardoned. God is a God of mercy 
and pardon and forgiveness. Israel had to suffer the consequences for their choices, as we all do. God does not take away the consequences of our choices. But they did not lose favor with God. Is this thing a little loud tonight? I don't know. I feel like I'm feeding back. But if it's okay for you, then, then it's all right for me. Um, yeah, so, so they did not lose favor with God, despite all of that rebellion. Quite the opposite. God's hand of protection was with them throughout the entire 40 years. He provided manna from heaven, like we have read, for the whole time. This, this supernatural bread from heaven to sustain them until they got to the promised land and were able to eat the actual fruit of the land once their punishment was over. Joshua 5.12 records that wonderful day. It says, Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. See that? God provided his protection until they could provide for themselves. And God cared for their physical health and their well-being as Moses reminded them when their wilderness journeys were over. Deuteronomy 8 verse 4, Moses is reminding the second generation, says, your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Deuteronomy 29 verse 5 elaborates on that and says, even your sandals have not worn out on your feet. How many of us have had a pair of sandals that last 40 years? <laughs> no, right? God kept them in good health even, the Bible says. Psalm 105, verse 37, speaking of this experience, God also brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. And just listen to the great love that God has, with which God speaks of this rebellious generation, even 800 years later in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 2, verses 2 and 3, God says, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. See, God's love for his people is greater than anything in the world. It is greater than any action we take. It is greater than any circumstance we find ourselves in. Yes, we can walk away from God. Yes, we can miss many of his blessings by following the desires of our own hearts instead of his rules and his commands. Yes, we may even miss heaven if our rebellion persists long enough and we refuse to repent. But nothing, even our rejection of heaven, nothing will ever stop God from loving us. Romans 8, verses 38 and 39, this is New Testament. Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the character of God. He is a God of justice, yes, but much, much more so, He is a God of grace and mercy. And it is only by the amazing divine grace that men can kill God for no reason by crucifixion, which is the single most cruel and humiliating and torturous method of execution ever devised by man. And despite them doing that, as Jesus hung there, dying, naked, in excruciating pain. By the way, that word excruciating comes from crucifixion. Excruciating. That's actually the origin of that word. So as he's up there in excruciating pain, rather than call down condemnation upon them, what does he do? Christ lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Humanity has no idea what we're doing. Grace means unwarranted, 
unmerited favor. In the context of punishment, grace means unwarranted, unmerited pardon. The ability to not suffer penalty for your wrongdoing, or at least not suffer the ultimate penalty for your wrongdoing. For Israel, grace meant not being sent back to bondage in Egypt. Grace meant not being destroyed by God. Grace meant good health, full bellies, safety, and even prosperity all in the middle of nowhere, in the Arabian desert. The Israelites tried really hard to lose God's favor during those 40 years in the wilderness. The book of Numbers is filled with many stories of their rebellions. And yet, at the end of the four decades, Moses has this to say about how God feels about them. Deuteronomy 33.3 Yes, he loves the people. All of his saints are in your hand. They sit down at your feet. Everyone receives your words. God always treated them with love and compassion and most importantly, mercy. Now, yes, God did have to squash a few rebellions from time to time and rebuke them, but that is no different than any loving parent would do because it was for their own good. Any parent, and I am a parent, I have a two-year-old little girl, any parent would rather punish and rebuke a child so that the child learns the danger of something instead of allowing the child to harm himself severely out of ignorance or bold rebellion. Right? Sometimes we have to lay down the hammer for the kids because they don't know any better. We have to teach them. And God was teaching the Israelites. God did, in fact, deal with them very strictly. They had a job to do. God had given them a job. Theirs was the privilege of retaining the knowledge of the Lord and the coming Messiah and to ultimately share all of this good news with the world around them. And so as such, as the, 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 um, the stewards of this amazing truth, God acts favorably toward them even in the midst of their rebellion. He sustained them always, giving them food and water. He reminded them often of his love for them. And friends, God never changes. The Bible even says that. I am the Lord. I do not change. Malachi 3, verse 6. See, God was willing to extend unmerited favor towards his people back then, and he is willing to do the same thing for us today. Many people in the world today want to come to God. Did you know that? But they don't come to God. They fear that they're too sinful, too corrupt, that God will somehow not accept them in their current condition. They want to clean themselves up first and then come to God. But see, that's against the very nature of God. Jesus says in John 6, verse 37, the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. And yet today, what you hear from many churches, even many individual Christians, is all about rejection and condemnation and God's hatred and burning and hellfire. Where is this Jesus who will by no means cast out the one who comes to him in faith? Where is the God of mercy when God's people preach condemnation? Jesus accepts every person exactly the way that he or she is. And we need not improve ourselves before coming to Jesus. We need not be sinless in order to earn his love. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 5 verse 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ came specifically because we were sinners, not because we cleaned ourselves up first. So to claim that Christ will not accept you because of your sins is to claim that Jesus was someone other than he actually was. It's simply not true. If you are a breathing human being and you desire Jesus, he desires you too. That's as simple as it is. If your skin is black, yellow, red, white, tan, brown, or even leprous, Jesus wants you. If your hair is thin or thick or curly or straight or frizzy or short or long or even gone, Jesus wants you. Amen? If you have lived an upright life by the world's standards or if you have lived in sin since your birth, Jesus wants you. 
I'm going to point at the webcam because Jesus wants you to. There is nothing that you have done. There is nothing that you are doing. There is nothing that you can do that will ever stop Jesus from wanting you. It's really that simple. Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 says this, It pleased the Father that in Christ all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. By Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Jesus reconciled all things to Himself on the cross. All things includes you and you. And praise the Lord, it includes me too. (laughs) So what exactly does this unwarranted, unmerited favor have to do with our salvation and with the return of Jesus Christ? Well, it has everything to do with those things. See, God's throne, God's very government, the very order and existence of the universe is based on and dependent on and centered on God's law. Outside of God's law, there is sin, there is destruction, there is chaos. Sin is the opposite of God. Sin was never intended for the universe. Sin brings death, and death is unnatural for God. God is the author of life, not death. God does not create things to to die. God is a God of life. But we do not adhere to God's law. We have not. We will not. We cannot. The standard of perfection is too high for sinful, fallen humanity to achieve. No one has ever perfectly kept God's law on earth except one. And who is that? Jesus Christ. That's right. And so how then can we ever hope to re-enter the family of God and rejoin the other worlds that are out there and the rest of the universe all living in perfect harmony with each other when we cannot even live in harmony with ourselves? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Sin makes us unfit for everything and anything except the grave. Though we were created in God's image, we have taken on Satan's image instead. We have gone from the highest created life, created life, to the very lowest created life. Earth is the armpit of the universe. As we have discussed, the natural reaction to kind of realizing this is to try to keep the law well enough to compensate for this lack, right? This gulf that exists between God and man. In fact, every, this is true. Every single religion that the world has ever known recognizes this gulf between humanity and whatever form of divinity that religious system prays to. All of them throughout time all require some sort of work or some sort of sacrifice in order to bridge this gulf. But biblical Christianity stands alone. And I want to underscore that. Alone even among other Christian churches. We have to go to the Bible for the true religion of Jesus. Biblical Christianity stands alone among all of the world's religions in one single important regard. Test me on this to see if I'm right. In the Bible, God himself provides the sacrifice. And he requires nothing from man in return. No other religion says that. Not even, unfortunately, many of our Christian churches. The biblical atonement is complete. At his death, Jesus said in John 19.30, It is finished. It's finished. Man, that's a haunting image. Goodness. It is finished because it is finished. (laughs) The atonement is complete. Mankind can add nothing to it. It's finished. I don't know how Jesus could have been any more clear. It's done. The world's religions present the believers with a list of do's and don'ts that will either incur the favor or the wrath of God, depending on which you choose. But biblical Christianity instead presents the believer with a choice. And that choice is, 
Do I accept what Jesus has done for me? Or do I reject what Jesus has done for me? And it's really as easy as that. God does not present the option of working for salvation. It cannot be worked for. It cannot be earned. This, by the way, is why the people who walk around in life saying, oh yeah, I'll go to heaven, I'm a good person. That, that's, that's not biblical. None of us are good. The Bible even says the only one who's good is God. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says this, It is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Can you imagine if it was up to us to earn heaven? We would turn this against each other. Oh, I'm a better Christian than you. I fed more homeless people this week. I'm a better Christian than you. I didn't do anything that even remotely seemed like work this Sabbath. I'm a better Christian than you. I haven't cussed in 10 years. <laughs> right? Can you just see? The list would go on and on and on and on. And it would build divisions between God's people instead of bringing us all together. Now, why not? What is the ultimate obstacle to working for salvation? Why is it not within our power to do so? We see in Isaiah 64, verse 6, the, the answer in the most clear way that I know of in the Bible. It says, We are all like an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness is, are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. This tells us that our best simply isn't good enough. The best possible set of good deeds that we could string together still falls short even of the lowest standard of heaven. And this is why I don't believe aliens visit here. Nobody visits here. <laughs> Look at our science fiction movies on this subject, right? A visitor crashes here accidentally, so we jack up the spaceship and kill the alien. Right? That's what we do. We steal the engine. We, we, we take all that technology for ourselves. That's what we would do. We don't know how to live peacefully with ourselves or with the rest of the universe. We can't do it. We've been trying since the very beginning and with no success as the United States is marching towards what it's what, like 50th war in the last five years. We don't know how to live peacefully with each other. But now I'm going to take it a step further here because in this verse from Isaiah, we see that all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. You know what that word filthy really means in Hebrew? It's this word, aid. It is from an unused root meaning to set a period, specifically the menstrual flux, by implication soiling. So what it's telling us here, I mean, how's that for a mental image, right? The very best that we have to offer towards God is as useful to God as a used tampon or maxi pad. We cannot earn God's favor. We simply don't qualify for heaven. No amount of law keeping ever could qualify us for heaven for two important reasons. Jesus says in Matthew 5, verses 21 and 22, one example, he says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So, I mean, when you look at the sixth commandment, do not murder, thou shalt not kill, right? You might say, well, I've never murdered a man, so I'm doing all right. But Jesus says, according to the law of God, unmerited anger is the same as murder. It's equivalent, right? You've already murdered the person in your heart, so it doesn't even matter if he's still drawing breath. Similarly, in verses 27 and 28, Jesus says, You have heard it, you've heard that it was said to those of old that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, I may never touch another woman besides my wife for my whole life. But really, how much better is it if I spend all day looking at porn and thinking of other women instead? Right? Am I fantasizing about these other women? I'm lusting after them in my heart. Am I being faithful to my wife in that instance? Certainly not according to the law of God. 
The law of God is much less about our outward actions than it is about inward purity. God is much less concerned with the gun in your hand than he is with the anger in your heart. Right? Be cleansed of the anger and you will put that gun down. The law of God is about the heart and our hearts are out of tune. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now we saw this morning that the new covenant actually writes God's laws on our lawless hearts. We saw this morning that the gospel promises to perform divine heart surgery on us, in fact. So there's simply no possible way that we can keep such a strict and lofty law well enough. It would be like an ant who is tasked with building the Sears Tower. I don't even think it's called the Sears Tower anymore, is it? Let's say the Empire State Building, okay? That's an ant being tasked with building up the Empire State Building. No matter how much time you give him, no matter how much instruction you give him, no matter what, all he's going to produce is an anthill. You can encourage him till you're blue in the face. All you're going to get is a pile of dirt. It is simply impossible. And get this, okay? Even if somehow we could keep the law well enough to earn God's favor, right? It would not make up for our previous sins. You can't work off a death sentence. A death sentence is only satisfied by death. It cannot be worked off no matter what. But see, God loves us so much. He loves us so much that he is not content with our exclusion from the kingdom of God. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <clears throat> Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, the living Word of God, or as it says in John 1.14, the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us, <laughs> and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word made flesh, right? The incarnate divinity, the creator of the universe, walking as one of us. Jesus the promised one, Jesus the Messiah. It was Jesus who lived the perfect life that was required for heaven. And then he bore the sins of every man, every woman, and every child, past, present, and future. And he died a sinless death, having become sin for us. Jesus died the death that we deserve. After living the life that we can't live, in order to overcome sin on our behalf and then impart his heavenly reward to us for free, for no reason, except that he loves us. That's the only reason. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now let me say this, okay, so that nobody misunderstands. Grace is an easily misunderstood topic. Grace is being allowed to enter the kingdom of God despite being completely unworthy to do so. However, grace is not a license to kind of carte blanche break God's law at will. Now, I hope that we have seen by now, especially if you were with us this morning, that the law of God holds the universe together. And its violation costs nothing less than the death of the violator. In Romans 3.31, Paul asks this question. He says, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. See, faith and the resulting grace of God that comes from faith can never make void the law of God. The Bible says the opposite. By faith, we establish the law. Grace somehow empowers us. It enables us to keep God's law as we never otherwise could. Still not perfectly. Don't misunderstand. But when we're covered by the blood of Christ, it's good enough. Grace leads to obedience, not disobedience. It makes no sense 
otherwise. Just picture it, right? Is there anybody who would take me seriously if I said, I love my wife so much that I'm going to go cheat on her repeatedly? No, right? I hope not, although that silence gives me some pause as to how we view marriage in this room. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes no sense, right? How about, I love you so much, I just can't stop punching you in the face. These are nonsensical things to say. Grace and love lead to obedience, not disobedience. It establishes the law because it destroys the power of sin in the believer's heart. The believer comes to desire God's laws and God's ways. God's ways become his ways. And Jesus sums it up thusly in John 14 and verse 15. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's a straight up, very easy thing to understand. If you love Jesus, you will do what he asks you to do. You will recognize that he knows best. His ways lead to life and love and forgiveness and eternal life. You will desire to please him as you would desire to please your spouse or your parent or anybody that you love. But note, this is an if-then statement. Now, in New York where I grew up, logic was a part of the math curriculum. I am led to believe it is not part of the math curriculum here in California. Did anybody study logic in high school? Or am I the only one? <laughs> okay. Here is a principle of logic, okay? If-then statements are statements of cause and effect. If A, then B. And it's written in logic shorthand as A, arrow, B, right? If A happens, then B results. So the rules of logic say that if this is a true statement, right? If you love me, then keep my commandments. And of course it is, right? Because Jesus only says true things, but then the statement's contrapositive is also true. That's the only other true statement that is always true, is the contrapositive. Now, what is a contrapositive? Contrapositive starts by saying, if A, then B. Its contrapositive is, if not B, then not A. Right? If B is the natural result of A happening, then if B didn't happen, A didn't happen either. So those are both true statements. Well, the statement in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, has a contrapositive, and it's this. If you don't keep my commandments, you don't love me. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? The love relationship between God and his people is a covenant relationship. God makes promises to mankind, and he keeps them, and mankind is obedient in return. So religion, right, many churches today often frame this incorrectly. They say that mankind's obedience somehow results in God keeping his promises to them, but that is not how it works. God's faithfulness comes first, and ours follows. God's love comes first, ours follows. 1 John 4.19 says this very plainly. We love him because he first loved us. God's victory comes first. Our victory follows. And it must follow that in that order because we cannot achieve victories of ourselves without God. I mean, right? Even Alcoholics Anonymous says as the number one thing to acknowledge your higher power. If you plan to break this addiction in your life, you need to recognize that there's something bigger than yourselves. So here, we acknowledge the higher power, not everybody's individual higher power, but the ultimate, only higher power, the God of Israel. We experience his victory over sin vicariously through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. His strength, not our strength. Friends, the law of God exists to define for us what is good and what is evil, right? What is right and what is wrong. It exists to demonstrate the size of the gulf between humanity and divinity. Romans 3.20 says it this way, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Right? The law teaches us what sin is. 
But no matter how ideal that law is, no matter how important it is to God and to existence and to the universe and to all living things, it is not ultimately the law that saves us from death. Only Jesus can save us from death. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we've looked at it once, but we're going to look at it again. This is a verse you should commit to memory, in my opinion. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, we will one day see the kingdom of heaven. We will be part of the kingdom of God, and we will live without sickness and death for untold, ceaseless ages of time, and it won't be because of a single thing that you did. I want you to think about that. As Americans, that's hard for us. We like to earn what we get. But we're going to get heaven because of what he did, not what we did. From heaven, the Son of God foresaw the price that it would cost him to bring us back. He saw the humiliation, the loneliness, the agony, the slow torment of the worst act of torture that the human mind could imagine, and he said, yes, that is what I want, if that's what it takes. My kids mean that much to me. I Choose that. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. It says the Son of God, before he became a man, was inherently equal with God. It was not robbery to claim equality with God, as it would be for you and me. It continues in verse 7. He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. As I said before, earth is the armpit of the universe. Mankind is of no reputation to everybody else out there, and Jesus was poor. He was at the bottom even of the earthly social order. Verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. And why? Why exactly did Jesus think that it was worth the cross? Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy that was set before him? It wasn't heaven. He had heaven already. He forsook heaven and chose the cross instead. So what was the joy that was set before him? Revelation 21.3, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Friends, the joy of Jesus was us. It was you, and it was me. He endured it all for us so that we might one day dwell with him forever. Friends, I mean, Christ hung on the cross. He died this slow, agonizing death to redeem man from the depth of sin. But was it the nails that held him there? The nails held every other victim of the cross there. But is there any iron on earth strong enough to hold down the Almighty God? No. No. Jesus said himself while he was being arrested in Matthew 26, 53, do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Just to let us know, right? It was not the force of the Romans that put him on the cross. He went there willfully. It was not the iron that held him on the cross. It was sin. My sin and your sin. We held him there. It was us. And this is the very essence of the gospel, the good news that Christ died so that you don't have to. Christ paid the penalty so that we might receive grace. Christ kept the law so that we might be enabled to do so as best as we can as well. Now friends, I am not perfect. 
I am very not perfect. Just ask my wife. She'll testify. But neither are you. (laughs) I am proud to say tonight, however, despite my imperfection, that Jesus Christ is perfect and I have chosen him as my Savior. I pray that everyone here has chosen him as his or her own Savior so that we may not be perfect by our own merits, but we can be perfect in the sight of God by the merits of Jesus Christ. One of the three final messages from God, we've been looking at these three angels' messages. One of those three messages that goes out to the world before Christ comes, we find it in Revelation 14, verse 6, and it says that another angel is flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people. It is the gospel message. The gospel has to go to the whole world. Everybody needs to know that Christ died on his or her behalf so that they can choose for themselves. Do I want that? Or do I reject it? And God will honor whatever choice they make. The Israelites learned of God's grace in the wilderness as they prepared to enter the promised land. Tonight, friends, we are on the verge of entering the heavenly promised land. I believe Jesus is coming again, and I believe he's coming soon. And we too must learn, just as they did, the gospel message of righteousness by faith, not by works. We are righteous because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, not because of what we do every day. We keep the law not to earn favor with God. The cross demonstrates that God's love cannot possibly be any stronger for us than it already is. We cannot make him love us more. We keep the law for the same reason that we don't abuse our children or cheat on our spouses or steal from our parents and friends. We love them, so we act to make them happy. We love God, so we act to make God happy. Right? It should be as easy as that. Now, many false prophets will come in the end times. Jesus promises that. And they will present faulty and erroneous methods of entering into God's kingdom. Those ways will result in the mark of the beast and the loss of salvation for anyone who follows them. We'll discuss those issues specifically over the next few weeks. So we must know in our hearts that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven or else we will be misled. John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We must be confident in our salvation, not because we deserve it, but because Jesus deserves it, and he offers it to us for free. See, God's law requires your death. To grant you re-entry into God's kingdom, Jesus died your death in your place and there is nothing left for you to do if you do not find a place in god's eternal kingdom it will be because of your own choices not to be there i know that's a not a pc thing to say but it's the truth it will not represent a lack of effort on god's part he already paid your price but he cannot force you to come tonight i am asking you if you're willing to come Revelation 22, verse 17, this will be our final scripture for the evening. The Spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Tonight there are, there are probably three groups of people in this, in this room tonight. And I want to reach out to all three groups. There will be people who are already walking in the love of Jesus and have never let it go. There will be people who used to walk with Jesus in the past, have fallen away, and are desiring to get to know him again. And then there will be those who have never known Jesus at all and want to get to know him for the very first time. I'm here to tell you, Jesus has a place for the members of all three of those groups. So it does not matter what group you are in. I am asking you tonight, do we want 
to receive the grace of God and live eternally with our Lord and Savior. If that's your desire, please raise your hand for me. Let me see it. More importantly, let God see it. Amen. This is a testament to the glory and the power of God. Thank you so much, my friends. Thank you for listening. Thank you for loving Jesus. And thank you for coming back tomorrow. Amen? <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for what you chose to do on our behalf. We are so thankful that you saw the worst that humanity could do and you said, I want that so that I can absorb it and get rid of it and allow my children to come home. Father, I want to pray for this world because this world doesn't know who you are. And there are many in this world who, who, who would want to know who you are if only someone would tell them who you are. And I pray that you bring those people to our attention. I pray that you give us the boldness to share what you've done in our lives and what you did on the cross and to share the invitation so that everybody might come to know you. And I pray as we part from this place that you minister to our hearts in a new way and in a powerful way to help us know once and for all that you are the righteous one, that we can only be righteous by our faith in you and not by anything that we can do. Thank you, Jesus, for everything that you are and everything that you've done and everything that you will continue to do until that great day of your appearing when you raise our fallen loved ones and take us all home forever. I pray all of this tonight in the holy and precious name of my Savior Jesus. Amen. Okay, I did not forget the raffle tonight. Praise the Lord. <laughs> But I want to just re remind you of the upcoming uh, seminars tomorrow at 7.15. Again, there will not be dinner here. We want you to eat dinner with your friends and family. Or if you have no friends and family, then by yourself with God. But we want you to have that time to yourself. So join us only for the message at 7.15 tomorrow. And then we have a couple days off. And we will be back on Wednesday also at 7.15. But on Wednesday, we will feed you because we don't want you to go home in between work and the seminar. So come and join us tomorrow and Wednesday at 7.15 as we progress forward in the story of hope. And we're going to raffle off this book. What is this book? Well, this book is by a funny-looking guy named Stephen Hicks. I wrote this book. It is called The Seventh Day of Christmas. The subtitle is A Story of the End Times. So if you want kind of a picture of the end times, what I did was I took the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation and I simply wrote a narrative on top of it. The idea was to put in book form, novel form, these prophetic stories so that we can reach other people who may not be willing to open up the Bible to learn it. So I'm giving it away for free. Starting next week, I will have them available for purchase if anybody wants a copy for themselves. But tonight, one lucky person gets to go home with this for free. So I hope you registered. <laughs> I really hope you registered. Okay, great. Yeah, last night's winner, uh, we, we also were giving this to you, so make sure that you don't leave without it. We've got it in the back for you. Tonight's winner is 1540. Number 1540. Oh. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. All right, my friends, I hope you have a, a safe drive home, a wonderful evening, and I'll see you back here tomorrow at 7.15. God bless you all. Thank you very much.